Welcome back everyone, this is Philip and today we'll be talking about the Stanford Prison Experiments, arguably one of the most exciting and fascinating experiments in all of psychology. This one's a big one, so strap in and get ready. Before we start, I highly encourage you to go down in the video description below and click on that video. This is a video, original footage, interviews with the researchers, the participants who were playing the guards and the prisoners in this experiment, giving their insight about their experiences. Absolutely fascinating, will form the foundation of this video, so please go and watch that now. When I went to school in 2004, I still remember seeing these pictures on in the news. The pictures showed US soldiers in Iraq at a prison called the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq, torturing and abusing prisoners of war. Now the question back then was why did these people, why, how were these soldiers able to behave in such a horrific manner and was this an isolated inf in incident? Uh, George W. Bush, the president back then, he, he claimed that this was an isolated incident, meaning it that didn't happen anywhere else in any of the other prisons that the American controlled, Americans controlled. But we know now that actually um, it was a bit more widespread than that. The famous Guantanamo prison on Cuba that was also controlled by the Americans um, showed similar behavior and, and abuse of, of prisoners. But it's not American, right? It's not that Americans are more evil or something like that. It is a very human thing that when you have a war, um, the aggressors usually act very, um, very horrifically towards the local population. And, and so the question then really is, why do people behave like that? In the previous lesson, we try to explain why people conform. And the two process theory highlights two reasons why people conform, which are the need to be right and the need to be liked. But both of these explanations really don't explain the behavior of these soldiers in the prison. So maybe there is a third way that we people conform or third reason why people conform. And that is the idea that people conform to their social roles. For example, what is a social role that could be knowing that you are a student or a teacher or a son or a daughter? These are the roles that we inhabit in our social environment, right? And so we all have an understanding of what a teacher or a student or a son is expected to do and how they are expected to behave. And so what we, the idea here is that when we are in that social role, we will behave accordingly based on our model in our head, understand our understanding of how a particular a person of that particular group is supposed to behave. This is Dr. Philip Zimbardo, a social psychologist interested in exactly that question. Do social roles impact our behavior in any significant way? So what he did, he invited standard, very regular Stanford students into a fake prison where they had to pretend to be prisoners or guards. So they were given the roles, the social roles of prisoners and guards. So for the prisoners, they were, these students were picked up from home by police, blindfolded, strip searched, deloused, again given a uniform and a number. All things that make this experience as real as it can be to the real thing, right? Participants that were assigned the role of a guard were given a uniform, handcuffs, clubs, keys, mirror shades to hide their identity. All of these were um, symbols of their social roles, right? Just like the prisoners were anonymized and given a number, the guards were anonymized by giving them shades so that they, you couldn't see where they look at. And that gives them a sense of power. So all of these tools or these uh, objects given, given to them and the things they were done to them were supposed to really ingrain the idea of a social role in these participants. So what were the results? The results were these. Guards became increasingly aggressive towards the prisoners. The study had to be actually stopped after six days due to the violence that the guards were showing towards the prisoners. Originally, the experiment was, be, so was supposed to go for 14 days, so they didn't even make it halfway through, right? So that's how severe the violence was. Prisoners became depressed and anxious, and three prisoners were released after the fourth day due to mental health issues. Absolutely incredible. So the conclusion is that participants conformed to their role, very much so. Now you might be asking, hold on a minute, how do we really know it was due to the social role, right? I mean, maybe they we just got lucky and picked the ones that would be just um, more aggressive towards prisoners, right? Well, the thing was that the assignment into the roles 
whether a participant, a particular participant would be a guard or a prisoner, that was assigned randomly, right? So the idea being here, if we would have switched the roles around, if all the prisoners were to be guards and all the guards would have been the prisoners, then we would have expected exactly the same behavioral outcome. Why? Because the assignment into those roles was random. Think of all names being written down on separate sheets of paper, put in a bag, and then you draw the names randomly and assign those names then to the roles of guards and, um, and prisoners. So there is no bias in how we selected these people, these participants, into their roles. So the answer here is that participants were randomly assigned into the groups, right? Therefore, we would expect the same behavior if the roles were reversed. Now let's look at some evaluation of this experiment. First of all, a big no-go is having no consent form. And that's exactly what happened in this experiment, right? Now let's go through what a consent form must actually do. And it's one of those standard ethical things that all um, experiments nowadays have to do. A consent form gives information about the experiment and the conditions under which this experiment will be conducted. And this is very important for participants to know. They need to know what their rights are as the experiment goes on. So usually you give and you explain what the aim of the study is, right? I'm going to get to that in a, back to that in a minute because oftentimes <laughs> if you reveal the aim of the study, the participants will behave in a certain way which will affect your results, right? So for example, in this experiment with the Stanford Prison Experiment, you wouldn't want to tell them, hey, by the way, we are looking at the influence of your social role um, on, on how you behave. That will kind of give it away, right? So you have to mask it somehow. Um, and what you can do is you can do something called debriefing, where you tell them after the experiment. But you really got to make sure that you tell them after the experiment so that they don't walk out of this experiment thinking they're a bad person, but actually understand what was going on, right? So that's the ethical thing to do. But usually, if you can, you would tell them the aim of the study beforehand. The second point is you need to have some kind of description of any possible risks or discomforts that you might expect them to experience, okay? That's just fair game. You gotta tell them what to expect, and then if they decide that is acceptable, they can still sign, and if they don't like it, they don't have to participate. At least, you know, they were informed. The other one is confidentiality of their data, right? You promise them you won't be, you know, talking about them um, with their name on, I don't know, social media or Twitter and talk about the results or share the information with somebody else. The idea being here, usually you say something like, we want to use your data. If we publish something, we're not going to use your name. We're going to anonymize the data so that nobody can figure out who really participated in the experiment. And we're also going to maybe delete your data after a certain amount of time when we're done with our research, right? You got to really stress that participation is voluntary, right? They are not being force coerced into participating in any way, right? And furthermore, on top of that, participants can leave at any point during the experiment. And they should really understand that they can literally, at any point in time, without explaining themselves, stand up, walk out of the room, and leave the experiment, and it will have no negative consequences for them, right? So it is a very participant-friendly document that needs to be in place nowadays in whatever research um, study you conduct, you got to have these points in place. Now, was this done in the Stanford Prison Experiment? No. These things were not um, communicated to the participants. Think about in the video that you saw in the beginning, how difficult it was for these participants to leave the experiment. Some, Many of them had to have mental breakdowns first before they were allowed to leave, right? Um, the aim of the study was not clear at all, right? The participants did not know what this experiment was about. They did get a debriefing after the experiment, so that's that's all right. Um, and now this one's a tricky one, right? You, We don't know really what the, the researchers were also quite surprised at the outcome of the experiments and couldn't have foreseen the risks and or discomforts that the experiment might, con might do to the experiment. Now, think about the implications that this might have on participants that mistreated somebody or somebody who got mistreated, you know, you could have caused real trauma. And I think some of the participants actually did carry away some trauma, thinking maybe something like, I'm a bad person for doing these things, how could I have? Um, or, you know, uh, somebody did something really mean to me, and that'll scar me for life, right? These are things to consider that, that the researchers just did not know that this is going to happen, but they should have seen it as it was unfolding in front of their eyes. And the question then is, why didn't they stop the experiment? That's another discussion to have later on. 
Demand characteristics is another issue. It basically refers to participants anticipating yeah, the intention of the researcher. So they're kind of figuring out what the aim of the study is and then acting accordingly. That if imagine, you know, you they you participate in a research study and you kind of like the researcher, you want to help them out with your research and you kind of figure out what they want to do. And, and so you change your behavior and your answers that you give so that it fits into what you think the researcher is investigating, right? And so that is in contrast to, for example, just thinking by for yourself um, what, what you feel want is the right answer to give. And that will change your results and you're not necessarily measuring anymore the true and unbiased answer from a researcher, but what they think you want from them, right? And that is different. And so basically this, this reduces the quality of your research and your results, okay? Another issue is something called internal validity. Internal validity refers to to how close you are to actually measuring what you want to measure, okay? Think of this. Here, down, down here, I have three bullet points explaining why this study has high internal validity, which is good, okay? So this study is strong because it has high internal validity. The, all the participants that were chosen for this experiment were screened with a questionnaire to check whether they are emotionally stable. Imagine the researchers hadn't done that. Right? You might have had some participants there that were emotionally very unstable. So if they behave in a certain way, right? if they are very aggressive as a guard or um, break down as a prisoner, you wouldn't have known whether they are just emotionally quite unstable or whether it was because of their social role that they were inhabiting. right? But because you checked for emotional stability and made sure that all of them are emotionally stable, you can now with more greater certainty say that you were measuring the effect of a social role. All right. Here's another example. Participants were randomly assigned to the guard and prisoner role. Right. That tells you that you didn't pick people that, for example, looked more muscular and pick them into the guard uh, group. Right. But it was randomly done. Right. This is quite a powerful idea that the behavior you saw from the guards was not because of you selecting certain people into those groups but because of randomness, meaning if you would have reversed the roles, all prisoners were guards or guards were prisoners, you would have expected the same outcome, right? That solidifies the understanding or the, the assumption that the behavior you observed was due to the social roles. Another evaluation point that we have to discuss is the idea of lack of realism. Because participants knew that the prison in which they were was fake, they were just play acting, right? They knew what a stereotypical guard or prisoner uh, usually behaves like from, for example, movies, right? This, one of the participants in the original uh, footage with the interviews said that he actually tried to behave like the Cool Hand Luke character in the, in the, in the movie that is also called Cool Hand Luke, right? Um, as his, he, this was basically his template for, for deciding how to be a prison guard, right? And he was also the guy who started to behave more violently towards the prisoners and then based on his behavior others started to emulate him and behave in the same way right and so you could argue that he was just play acting right he wasn't really acting out of his own belief um, but he was there was a kind of a demand character characteristic going on here as well saying do you know what this is, yeah this is a fake experiment uh, fake prison but um, I know what is expected of me um, as a, a stereotypical prison guard, so I will behave accordingly. Oh yeah, I remember this movie, Cool Hand Luke. I'm just gonna behave like that guy right there. So it turns more like into a game rather than what they actually truly think they should do. Um, so they weren't really acting independently, but based on some role-playing idea, okay? Similarly, the prisoners might have rioted because they watched for movies that this is usually what prisoners do. Here's a very strong counterpoint. So some of the research, there's a very strong counterpoint to this. It is this. From the analysis of the experiment, we could see that 90% of the conversations that the prisoners and, and prison guards had with each other were about prison life. So they were really, really much into it. Huh? Furthermore, prisoner 416 actually believed he was in a real prison, suggesting that it was so real that he actually believed it was a real prison. Two points suggesting that lack of realism was not happening. This was real enough. Another thing we need to consider is whether the social roles were actually exaggerated. It turns out that only one third of the guards were actually mistreating prisoners. One third, that's not even 50%, right? 
right? So this bad, bad experiment that we always talk about and hear about since for a few decades now, in that original experiment, only a third of the guards were actually mistreating prisoners, right? And some of them actually even offered cigarettes and reinstated privileges for the prisoners, so were quite supportive. So maybe, right, maybe, maybe the dispositional influences, so factors that are inside of you, like your personality, may have a greater impact than expected. So it wasn't the roles, but it was just your personality. Maybe the one third of the guards that were mistreating prisoners were just internally, as a person, just different from the rest, you know, and it didn't matter whether you were assigned the role of a guard or not. Um, they were always going to be more aggressive towards others, right? And you would have expected, similarly because it was randomly assigned, if you would have switched, um, swapped around the guards for the prisoners, with amongst the prisoners, you would have probably also found maybe something like a third um, of them being more aggressive and then acting in a similar way, right? So maybe a third of the worldwide population is generally just more aggressive and will act accordingly, right? And has nothing to do with social roles. Maybe that is that is something really to consider here. Now, this is the last evaluation point, something extra, extra. So if you can mention this in one of your um, essays, that'll be fantastic. There's this idea of the social identity theory. And what it says is that we have a sense of self, right? This is my, this is what I believe is me. And, and inside of that, I have a sub area that uh, where I basically define who, what my social identity is, right? I might be, I might say I'm a teacher, I'm a male, I'm a, um, I uh, play the piano or something like that. So all of the roles that I inhabit are inside of here. Now, whatever the prison guard identity is, I might say I do not identify with being a prison guard. It's just something that doesn't fit my personality. And therefore, it doesn't matter whether you're going to be assigned the prison guard role or not. You're just not going to act like a prison guard because you don't, it is not inside of your social identity circle, right? So here, the idea is to say, Mr. Zimbardo, forget it. Your, your theory about the influence of social roles, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is whether we identify with a social role that we are given, right? If you tell me to be a prison guard and it's not inside my understanding of a social identity, then I will not behave according to a prison guard, right? So, so that is exactly, uh, the, that's the idea behind uh, the social identity theory. Before we close off, I'd like to talk about why humans conform in the first place. And we're going to take a biological evolutionary perspective on this. Imagine you are part of a herd like a buffalo or a zebra and you wander off, right? You left, you leave your herd. You're more exposed now to predators to hunt that could hunt you down, right? So it would make sense to stick with the herd and do as the herd does, right? Usually the herd is smarter than you and therefore you do, you would do good by doing as the herd does. And you could apply the same to humans. Maybe we still have inside of us a little instinct that tells us to do as others do in order to feel safe, in order to be safe, in order to maximize the chances of us surviving. You might think, that is weird. I'm not going to be followed by a saber-toothed tiger anytime soon. But you got to remember that these systems were developed over millions of years and we haven't been exposed to... Um, to dangerous predators for just a few hundred years or a few thousand years, right? So our systems are still in place because we have only recently transitioned into living in cities and dominating our environment and making sure that we're not being hunted down by some, some other animals. So therefore, these system are, systems are still in our head, right? And we can't just override them. They are part of our nature, right? And so the idea here being we conform because that is what made us more likely to survive. So that's it for today. If you'd like to download these slides, you can find them uh, following the link in the video description below. If you are a teacher and you'd like to quiz your students on this content, you can sign up for free on ZenTeach and um, use our quizzing tool. Um, consider donating, following us on Twitter and YouTube, and definitely subscribe to get all the latest YouTube videos. The next lesson will be on obedience. Mm -hmm.